first of all, uh, was Rick an influence during your youth, or when did when did you remember him first becoming an influence on you? Uh, well, basically, like most people of my generation, I started noticing Rick as uh, a kid in the family on TV. Mm -hmm. um, there was a natural association just because he was, uh, you know, a youngster on television with a starring role. That was kind of unusual. Uh, and then at some point in the show, he became a fan of rock and roll, just like the rest of us. There was just a natural, he was like every other kid in the same position. And then one day, uh, just kind of for fun, the, the episode I remember was he dressed up for Halloween and he was Elvis, right? He put on sideburns and the whole thing, and which is like what we all wanted to be, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very natural. And it's, suddenly, within months of that, he had made a record with I'm Walking. And uh, I, really, that, I really stood up. I really, like, paid attention. And the uh, episode was a thing where Ozzy was trying to... He was agonizing over his son choosing between sports, which was football, and music, which was a drum, right? And uh, I think Rick falls asleep, and then the, the father, like, pulls the drum out from under his arm and slides a football in there, you know? And, uh -huh. of course, the laugh track comes on and everything. Um, but at the end of the show, Rick does the song, I'm Walking, and it was great. And you go, wow, he's really pretty good. <laughs> and... Uh, he had a, the other side of that was Teenager's Romance, which became a big hit. I think it, it was a million seller. In fact, Rick just went through this amazing string of million sellers. Yeah. Now, that was a ballad, and his next one was a ballad. Um, and, it, you know, he was just a guy. But the third record was called Bebop Baby, which was, he was starting to hit the, the rockabilly thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, I became a fan, like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. And he's, I didn't know it till later, but he surrounded himself with incredible musicians. One, of course, which was James Burton. And from that moment on, I was I was just an absolute fan of Ricky Nelson Freak. Um, stood up and waiting in school, and that second album really nailed me. He had uh, "You Tear Me Up" and "It's Late." I mean, that's an amazing record. Yeah. And you know, James is all over that. And at that point, I mean. It was like, it went hand in hand for five, six, seven years, Rick and James, and just this, I mean, he was very authentic. That's the part, that's really why I'm talking to you today, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think he got overlooked because he was a TV star, and people tend to lump him with the, you know, the Bobbies and the Frankies and all that stuff from Philadelphia, and that was not his role at all. Yeah. Um, now... When did you start playing music? Uh, did you start as as a a kind of identification with him, or you know, was it that much of an influence? Or when you started playing music, was it the type of thing where you wanted to put out songs like Rick was singing? Um, here's how it worked for me, John. Um, naturally, Elvis was like boom, you know, the, the thing that was ignited. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a couple, three years before that, i I'd been musical since I was four. Uh, it was popping out of me. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was eight, which is around 1953, I had already named myself <laughs> what I was going to be when I grew up. I was going to be Johnny Corvette and the Corvettes. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, you know, I already had the, the imagery down and the whole thing. This was preceded Elvis by a couple, three years. Elvis came along and just like showed everybody how it was done. Because, you know, up until then it was, you know, groups or vocal groups or whatever. He, he became, Elvis became the role model. I would say still. I mean, he, he was the essential rock and roll singer, you know, living out the part in real life and all that. Mm -hmm. But for me, what came next was Carl Perkins because he wrote and played and sang. And I loved his, you know, his early music. Many, many years later, I came to find that for Ricky Nelson, it was the same guy. We both shared the same idol. Yeah. Um, and we both went in that direction at the same time, except Rick was doing it in public. I mean, amazing. You know, at 16, he was a rock and roll star. Um, and at that point, I became a Rick Nelson fan. I mean, I was just, I was a kid. I was in grammar school mm -hmm. when Ricky Nelson was a rock and roll star on TV. Um, 
having that great band and making valid rockabilly records, every bit as good as Carl's records and Jerry Lee Lewis's records and Elvis's records, um, put Rick in that rare club for me. I mean, I would buy his records and try my darndest to learn the guitar solos, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, his records, number one, it wasn't until later I went to a friend's house and played his records on a good stereo that I found out how well they were made. See, I just had one of those little kid record players, you know, yeah. little two, three inch speaker. But when I would play them on a really good system, I found that, my gosh, these are the best records being made right now. They were better than a lot of the stuff out of Memphis, to tell you the truth. Um, I've only just recently met James, by the way, so we've we've become friends and shared a lot of stories about those days. Yeah, he's a great guy. I, yeah. I was wonderful talking to him. Listen, I'm going to ask you to repeat for me a story that I heard you tell on uh, on the on the television tribute that Greg McDonald did uh, to Rick about the song "Stood Up." I understand that has a real special significance to you. Well, yeah, um, for years and years while I was, uh, let's say, in my cave, all the years I was gone, um, that was one of the songs I would work on over and over. I, I think this is what you're getting at, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I've, always, I've always thought that was just a great, great record. Um, that's a classic example of a, you know, a really hot, great rockabilly record. And I, pl I played that thing probably a thousand times over the years, just for myself, just keeping my uh, musical, you know, chops up. And I've always intended to record that. Someday I'm sure I will. In fact, <laughs> now that I know James, uh, <clears throat> the wheels are kind of turning. Maybe we'll do it together. Who knows? <laughs> so it, that was just something that, that, as I understand it, you used to go into, the, into your studio or whatever and just do it over and over again. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's one of the ones that really stood out to me. Whenever I'd want to do kind of a, a rockabilly uh, mood type thing, I always pick that song. It's just, that's a great song, a great record. Yeah, it is. Um, is that your favorite Rick Nelson song? Um, it's right up there. He <clears throat> he made so many. I mean, there's just, you know, if you if you get a hold of the, uh, like, Ricky Nelson's greatest hit record. Got him. And it doesn't have them all on there, but it, it's, I mean, there's... It's a two or three record set, I can't remember. There's like 30, 40 incredible tracks. You know, you, you, I mean, he had kind of different phases. He had all the great stuff like the rockabilly stuff, like It's Late and You Tear Me Up and Stood Up. Mm -hmm. and then he's got all the ballad stuff like Lonesome Town and, uh, you know, things along in that vein. Yeah. And then he's got the things that are kind of like, uh, what was it, Restless gun restless on, kid uh, that second album restless kid yeah restless kid is restless kid i was going to say that and i thought no it doesn't sound yeah. right and then he, he went through that whole kind of uh era like you're my one what, what was it called uh you are the only one da, 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 that's da, it yeah you are the only one. that kind of vein just i mean amazing amount of stuff in you know in a different variety you remember the one that was um oh geez I, I Want to Be Loved, I think it was called. Yeah, uh, You're Going to Love Me Like I Want to Be Loved. Yeah, it was almost a yeah. jazzy kind of... Well, you know, what was surprising, John, is that I read an interview with Rick um, during the research for the show, and I guess he had started out when he was very, very, very young, like six and seven and eight, listening to the Jazz Masters. Uh -huh. You know, that was Ozzy's influence. Of course. And it was surprising to find that l later on he did stuff that, that had definite jazz overtones in it. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you a piece of trivia I just picked up. You know the song, Someday, Someday You Want Me to Want You? Right. Rick played drums on that, and Ozzy Nelson played the piano. I didn't know that. Because the musicians, it, it was another one of the late recording sessions. The musicians had left that played those instruments, and uh, they tried to call them back because they had thought of the song to put down. And Ozzy said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll play the piano, you play the drums. And uh, I guess they had, uh, they had still had a, you know, a couple of the other guys there, so they finished up the song that way. Well, and you I, know, it's, it's amazing because that's like not rock and roll or rockabilly at all. No, it's not. But here's to, to point out like the influence of, of Rick on me. When my little band was like, we were 13, 14 years old, we were the Blue Velvets, and we played sock hops and stuff like that. That was one of the songs we did. 
We no did kidding. someday because Rick did it. I mean, that's that's kind of an off the wall choice for a group of kids that are doing, you know, basically yeah. Wayne Eddy and the Ventures. And yeah, yeah. It was because Rick had done it, and it was a nice uh, that arrangement was, you know, great. Um, we ended up doing, you know, including that as part of our stuff, even though we were stone rock and rollers with ducktail hairdos and the whole bit. I want to ask you about that that period uh, that Rick went through. Um, right about 19, I think, I'm thinking 66, when the whole world was into psychedelia and a, yeah. a lot of that, Rick chose to go country right. and went real country. He sure did. And then he came back to a soft country rock sound. Um, Randy Meisner said that he was certainly one of the forerunners of rock, uh, country rock. Right. Uh, what's your opinions of, of those years of, of uh, going country and all the rest? I mean, why would somebody do that when the, the fad, the trend, was so obviously in a different direction? Why do you think Rick did it? Well, probably the, the same reason, you know, we kind of uh, resisted that, too. Credence did. We weren't mm -hmm. really psychedelic. Uh, no, we weren't. Delic, Delic. When the whole world was doing uh, that, we were kind of more funky R&B. And I think um, Rick, for Rick, he was just way ahead of his time. His his recording of She Belongs to Me is just, um, you know, very essential. It's a great record. Yeah. It was always my favorite version of that song. Yeah, that's the one that Linda Ronstadt heard and decided she would sound good with a steel guitar in her band. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he was going along doing that. And, you know, as you said, it was just 180 degrees away from what everybody else was eating up at the time. And kind of culminated um, in Garden Party. I mean, I, I, that was that sound down to a T. It was great. Yeah. Um, what do you think Rick Rick's contribution over the 29 years that he was a recording star. What do you think the the sum total of his contribution to music is? Well, number one, it was his approach was to make fabulous records. Nothing was ever like just sloughed off or off the cuff or thought of as a as a throwaway cut. You know, I, I just thought he was very careful in his choice of material. I mean, he had very very high standards, and the the band was always fabulous. Um, and also, this is something I said about him at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Be believe it or not, Rick was my role model. Um, when I, as a young guy, you know, rock and roll was very rebellious and was kind of a James Dean, tough guy, bad guy image. Mm -hmm. That was always cool. You know, everybody wanted to be, in fact, that was the word. Everybody wanted to be cool with their collar up and black leather jacket and the whole bit. And Rick seemed to be a real solid, wholesome guy and yet made, um, you know, it, valid rock and roll records that rocked out as much as anybody yeah. and as a young guy I looked around and I thought well I want to be mostly like Rick you know I don't I don't want to be crazy and wild and uh, you know arrested and you know, all the other things that was happening to many of our rock and roll heroes he just seemed to be a solid guy and that's that's the part I uh, clung to as I was growing up um, in terms of and I uh, like to get get this question out to guys who are professional musicians and and, and uh, like I asked Randy Meisner and such uh, one of the things that's really impressed me about Rick is that he seemed to be in the end of it all not a star at all he seemed to be just a man a musician who just wanted to keep on the road and keep playing for the for the audiences and uh, didn't give a damn I guess whether it was for 25 people or 2500 people or 25,000 people which he which he certainly played at all uh, how do you feel about about that picture of of Rick Nelson who started out as a star and later just settled for being uh, you know the gypsy pilot the traveling man the the musician that hit the road all the time um. Well, I think you're, you're accurate. I mean, he loved music. He, it, you know, anybody that takes the care that he did, I mean, it just obviously showed in his work that he cared that much about what he was doing to hone it and make it good. And somebody like that is going to keep playing regardless of the fortunes of career. You know, let's face it. I mean, uh, nobody ever... You, you just have ups and downs. That's life. It, mm -hmm. it, it, no one sustains at that white hot peak forever you just can't do it but he chose to keep playing anyway i mean he certainly was well past the point of needing it for uh, financial reasons or to you know to prove his point or anything he did it 
because he loved it. Um, in talking with his kids, though, I I do know that personally. In fact, he even said it. He said I'm. He said something in fact that I'm more than just teeth. He, he said that to me even. I'm not one of those uh, teeth guys. And he was t speaking specifically of the, the, you know, the late '50s, early '60s mm -hmm. Philadelphia bunch, who a lot of whom basically pose for pictures a lot. Yeah. And that was his way of summing it up. He says, no, I'm not one of those tooth guys. I, I'm, I'm a musician. I make music. And I think he was very fiercely, intensely uh, proud and stubborn about that. That's why he went out on the road to, as much as he could to show uh, people his music. Now, as, as a, a man who certainly tasted celebrity in his own right and and played to the big crowds and had the hit records and such as you have um how do you how do you feel when you view that type of man i mean w what feelings do you get about that type of person um well like i said he became a role model so i'm i'm almost a carbon copy if you will um you know it, it was like i said carl perkins was our shared idol. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, I think, because he was musician. You know, I mean, everybody loved Elvis, of course, and all that, but Carl wrote, sang, and played. Yeah. And it was that image, that, that musician image of wanting to be part of the band, part, part of the music. In fact, quite content to stand back and just play as a side man. I've always said that from years ago, that I'd be quite happy just being a side man. Mm. Um, so I, I share the same emotion. We talked about that a few times, and uh, we used to we used to wonder if there'd be a way we could just kind of travel around and not be the face guy, you know? Yeah, John Fogarty and Rick Nelson as sidemen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I would love to see that band any day. Uh, how how often did you meet Rick, John? I mean, when did you first meet him, and and, and did it become a friendship that carried on through the years, or? Well, I first met him in 1976. There was kind of a, um, a thought or a project floating around, let's say, that uh, someone at his record company wanted me to produce him. And I, since I was kind of locked in the doldrums of my own problems, I was resisting. I just said, I'm, I'm really too screwed up right now to try, you know, consider doing anybody. Uh, because I, I was afraid that I would mess it up more than help, you know? Mm-hmm. But I did meet with Rick at that time and found that um, what you saw was what you got. He was he was absolutely what he appeared like through the media, just a very nice guy and down to earth. Um, then we began to kind of meet each other more often, uh, basically through the media or over the phone. He did a couple, or he did one song of mine in the late '70s, I think, on one of his albums, and I wrote to him and thanked him about it. And then. Uh, the year, really the year, the last year he was alive, the year of Farm Aid, uh, we met down in Memphis. He was at that session. We talked on the phone a few times, and uh, I could see that our paths were going to cross more and more. I was pretty excited about a growing friendship, actually. That's, that's kind of why it was a double tragedy for me, because it was kind of a long-held dream of mine that we would get together more and more, and yeah. you know how life is. You kind of... <laughs> You, you do things and then you drift apart and then you do things and I could see that we were drifting closer and closer together and then uh, when the accident happened it just it was a double shock to me because it was like my lifelong dream was not going to happen it took away what you had and also what you were going to get yes exactly yeah um you you worked the uh, down in the Memphis sessions uh, thing together. Did you do Farm Aid together also? He was well. This is one of those tragic stories. The next day, um, they were all going to leave on that plane uh, together to go to Farm Aid. And uh, according to Marty Stewart, who is was at the time was part of Johnny Cash's band, and he was uh, he was there that night mm -hmm. and uh, was helping us all kind of. In fact, he performed on uh, Big Train from Memphis. Uh, as a singer, he was standing right next to Rick and Dave Edmonds. As a matter of fact, they did a harmony chorus on it that was wonderful. It's, uh, the three of them plus um, Carl Perkins did a, a harmony version. It was really neat. Anyway, the next day they were all going on that plane. Uh, I, I took a, 
a normal commercial jet and flew up to Farm 8. Mm -hmm. And Rick and his guys got on the plane, and the, it taxied down. I didn't hear this until much later, but it rolled down the runway, and one engine went poof and died, so they quickly stopped it. And the mechanic said, well, I can have it fixed in a half a day, something like that. But they all decided to just go home. Yeah. And they, in other words, they kind of averted a tragedy for a few days. Yeah, but, for the time um, being. You know, tragically, it was not enough to just, well, you know, at that moment, I think they should have just gotten rid of that plane. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I know you're, you're very busy. And th the final question I'd have for you is uh, you obviously... You know, cared for him very much as as we all did. Have a very personal perspective of him. I would like you you to tell us how would you like the world to remember Rick Nelson? Um, basically, starting with his induction into the Hall of Fame, um, it's like I would like him to have the credit that's been long overdue. That he was really one of the pioneers of rock and roll. I mean, he's an essential pioneer in the same sense that Little Richard and Fats Domino and Elvis and Chuck are pioneers. He was there right at the beginning. I mean, amazingly, his, those records, the early ones are out in 1956. And if you think of, you know, Elvis made his breakthrough that same year. Mm -hmm. uh, that puts Ricky Nelson right there. I was in the sixth grade. Um, I would like the world to remember him as a classy guy who, that made wonderful, wonderful rock and roll records and uh, certainly contributed immensely to the, to the fabric of early rock and roll. And if I can hold you for just one more second, will you quickly give me an overview of Pat Woodward, uh, Andy Chapin, uh, Bobby Neal? And uh, the other gentleman's name is escaping me, and I can't. Uh, Ricky Enfeld. Would you give me an overview of what else we lost there in terms of uh, the musical world when that plane went down? Um, a few words about the Stone Canyon. Band. Certainly. I now I didn't know them all personally, but I had gone to uh, one of Rick's last concerts. Was here at, in Los Angeles at the Universal Amphitheater. Um, it was it was a bill he shared with Fats Domino. It was at, it wasn't one of his last concerts, but it was during that last year. And he, Rick was absolutely wonderful, it was stunning, and the band was a killer. It was great. I mean, he he did all the hits, and I just I turned to my friend and I said, "Man, this stuff is just so good." I mean, it it was just like records, and Rick was putting everything he had into it, you know, he was never lazy about it. I did finally go backstage and meet everybody. I met Bobby, and I met Rick, a drummer, who was absolute, uh, uh, you know, stone rockabilly drummer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was great. Um, Bobby was, uh, I heard, getting me, getting to be known as the heir apparent to James Burton. That could be. He sure. <laughs> I had joked with him about that when he did the solo for Traveling Man and the solo for uh, Believe What You Say. You know, I just looked at him and said, "Well, have you gotten a call from James yet?" <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, but he's happy." You know, I, he said I played it note for note, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I and mean, he did. He had it down. He was, those were wonderful musicians. Absolutely, he did a song the night of that concert. He said, this is our new single. It was absolutely as good as any rockabilly record. Um, absolutely hot band. See, they were quite capable of doing that and pulling it off, like you say. It was this is my way of of saying thank you to somebody who was very, very dear to me. You know, uh, Rick was Rick was my role model when I was a young man. That's, and, well, great. That's great to hear. And to have you come on and and share this, because I know you don't often do this this type of thing. I really do very, very sincerely appreciate it, and uh, I'm going to be sending a copy of the special out to uh, out to Berkeley once right, it's thanks. done, and I would like you to have it. And again, please accept all of my gratitude and best wishes for uh, for being part of this. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, as you know, he was very special to me, too, and that, that yeah. is why I'm doing this. Yeah, and I, I really do appreciate it. It was wonderful to have you on. All right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.